My name is Ruth Barwell, and I have some stories. Uh, along with a number of us, we have some stories to tell you about um, things that are happening and kind of, I'm not a, you know, a Southern Baptist preacher or anything like that where I say, this is what the Lord is doing, but there's something interesting happening, stirring among us in this congregation, something happening locally, and something happening nationally too. And I, I don't know if you'll agree with me at the end of this, that something, maybe at this time in the world's history, Canada is being called to do something very important, um, to create hospitality, to create welcome to people in the world who are in need of homes and love and security. So right now I'm gonna tell you a different story, a story you're really familiar with, I'm pretty sure. It's a story that we've all heard, but I'll just read it to you. One day, a man was walking along the beach and when he noticed a boy hurriedly picking up and gently throwing things into the ocean. Approaching the boy, he asked, young man, what are you doing? The boy replied, I'm throwing starfish back into the ocean. The surf's up, the tide's going out. If I don't throw them back, they'll die. The man smiled to himself and he said, don't you realize there are miles and miles of beach and hundreds of starfish? You can't make a difference, son. After listening politely, the little boy picked bent down, picked up another starfish, and he threw it into the surf. And he said, I made a difference to that one. Perhaps, like me, you can feel really overwhelmed, kind of bombarded. I mean, the Ukrainian war goes on and on. Um, there's climate change that continues. There are shootings. There are protests, there are convoys. I mean, sometimes I just want to go, stop. And I, I want to make a bubble of myself and just live in my little bubble. Sometimes even worse, I kind of, at times I've, I'm guilty of shuddering my heart. I can't, I can't handle it anymore. And sometimes you realize that um, you can only do a small thing. You can't, you can't, do big things, but you can change the trajectory of someone's life in a very, by doing small things. And the small thing that happened to me this spring was someone in our own congregation. It was Colleen Gradanis. Colleen, why don't you just stand up and come on up. And you were maybe at the same meeting I was, but God touched me in maybe a different way than God touched you. And we, we all, you know, hear God's voice a little bit differently in our lives. So Colleen says, what are we going to do about the Ukrainian situation? And then Ed, you yeah, just stand up, Ed. Come on. Come on, you two. <laughs> so Ed just stand, so Ed, Ed lends voice to, to Colleen. And he says, because he's, he's, he's chair in the meeting, you know, he says, um, what are we going to do? Does anybody want to do a bit more research with that? So then Carrie, she says, I'll help. So the three of us, the three women, so Ed just hands that off to the three women. <laughs> and he says, uh, so we get together for coffee. We have a lot of fun, actually. We laugh quite a bit for all the heaviness that this topic uh, engenders. And so then the three of us kind of get together. And um, why don't you come up, Carrie? And, and more people become involved. So the three of us, and uh, yes, quite a few others, just realized we had quite a, a passion, and as, as Ruth said, perhaps a calling, to do something to help a refugee family by bringing them to a safe, welcoming community, which we know is Owen Sound. So Ruth and Colleen then did some research, and what we discovered is that the systems for bringing refugees to Canada are extremely complex. There's many different uh, procedures. And we learned that the Ukrainians fleeing the war right now are under a special program. And for many reasons, it would be better um, for us to sponsor a refugee under another program. And I, I don't want to um, belabor all the acronyms and it, it was just very complex but if we use the program called BVOR 
we would get the guidance of the expert at the um, PCC, who's been very, very helpful. And also the government will do cost sharing with us for the one year of uh, support that we legally agree to, to give the family. So we uh, would have to, we are going to be responsible for six months of uh, their care and support, and the government will provide six months as well. So for those two reasons and many others, we, we, we thought this BVOR sounds like the right thing. And then we learned that they are some of the most vulnerable refugees, and they have been vetted by the UN already, so they are ready and waiting. They've been screened, and some of them are waiting in refugee camps or other temporary accommodation. So we formed a larger committee, uh, the, the Ken and Mary Frook and, and others. I haven't, because of the masking, I act, and I'm a new member, I don't actually know, I know Ken and Mary, um, uh, uh, Mahmoud and Hayat are, are helping us, so thank you for that. And then there's Dick Hibma has helped, and I don't know all the others, I apologize. So on May 17th, we made a presentation to session, and we asked for support. Um, we asked for using the, the congregation's resources to assist us, both financially and manpower, human, emotional support. We asked uh, for a commitment to help us cover that six months of financial support that we need to, to uh, commit to. And uh, a few days later, we were thrilled to learn that Session agreed with our request and said yes, and that we could proceed. So we, we uh, asked for some time to talk to the congregation, and that's where we are today. Have you ever played the game of whack-a-mole? That kid's game, it's battery-operated, and these heads just go around this board, and as they come up, you whack them with a stick? and the person who can whack the most heads is the winner of the game. Well, for me, the last three years has felt like whack-a-mole. You kind of get your head down, every once in a while you peek up, and then whack, there comes COVID, and then you get that down, recharge your batteries, whack, Ukrainian war, whack, the loss of a loved one, whack, interest rates are going up, whack. It's like, whoa, pretty soon you just want to stay down and hope your batteries run out. That's the way life treats us. And pretty soon you can get hopeless. And you can think, where, where is my hope? How do I get recharged? Well, we have a God of hope. And he talks to us about peace, love, grace, and acceptance and helping one another. And when God plays the game, it's more like a game of tag. At least that's my experience. It's sort of tap, tap. Tap, tap. You're it. And it's like, what would you like me to do? In my ca case, it was tap, tap. What are you going to do about this? And then the next person got the tap, 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 tap. Pretty soon there was a lot of us in the game of tag. So my encouragement to you is become part of this game. God's going to play it with or without us. He is working to get his people to safe places within our community. And I hope you'll be part. Something that was really... Um as, as more and more people started to play tag um, and throw a starfish, we started to um, become acquainted. You know, you, your ears perk up. And our family, uh, Doug's family, was having a, a garage sale, and, um, and it was a charity garage sale. So as people were walking in the driveway, I would say to them, um, you know, this is for charity, it's a no, no tag on, just give generously, you know, it's going to the Canadian Food Grains Bank and it's going to refugees in, um, that are coming to Owen Sound. Come on up, you guys. And so I met this lovely couple who came to our garage sale and they're my, our neighbors. And so um, I wanna introduce you to, uh, just, yeah, just grab one of those. And I wanna introduce you to Mahmoud and Hayat Ismail have a seat, guys. I'm going to sit down with you. Um, and they uh, came from Syria. So, so here they are walking into the, our garage sale and saying, we were refugees. Um, no, you're going to use that, Mahmoud. <laughs> um, 
They said, we were refugees five years ago. We came from Syria, didn't have a word of English, um, came, um, well, I'm gonna let you tell the story in a second, and came and um, were greeted by the Lutheran Church in Owen Sound, yes? You guys have an amazing story. I'm gonna wrap up a minute. There, so now, uh, Mahmoud and Hayat are living down the street from us. They are, they're homeowners, Canadian citizens. They have five children who didn't come, but they are quite cute kids, one born in Canada. And um, tell me a little bit, Maybe I'll start with you, and I'm going to encourage you, yeah, speak right into the microphone. Um, Doug, is this mic going to interfere if they just share this mic? Okay. <laughs> um, so you'll, you'll need to kind of, yeah. yeah, you got it. So tell me, how did this, the war start, the conflict start in Syria at the very beginning? Give, start us from the beginning. Yeah, this was uh, three, four boys. So they wrote in the wall, we don't want the president. So after that, they took the, these boys and they put them in jail. And they start to take their nails off and- Torture them? Yeah. So that's why people, they say, because of these children. And they don't know anything. They don't know what they wrote in there. They under, don't understand what this means. So the people in Syria rose up and yeah. said, you're torturing children for speaking something very yeah. relatively innocent. Yeah. 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 So this is start in Syria so then about the president, these kids. What happened then? So then the president, he invited other countries to join in the, the war? Or what happened then? Yeah. yeah. Like uh, Russia came and China, United States, all country they came, yeah. So... Mamu, what propelled you guys out of your home? So the war has started now in Syria, and there's this conflict going on, and there's cities and towns being, what, bombed? Yes, bomb. Uh, was starting uh, Dara, named city, in Syria. After that, they came to my city. Which is what city? Lost, Aleppo. My Aleppo. city is Aleppo. Yes, uh, and the government hit the uh, bomb, you know, of the people. Yes, we stay at home, but not safe. We don't know what time coming bomb to yeah. us in the house. So what did you do then? Just to stay at home. We say, God, he knows. Uh, after that uh, came the... ISIS. So ISIS came and moved into? Yeah, to my village, because I'm in the village, in the big city. They came, they want my village. They first hit the people, the bomb. We running away to the farm. You had a the family farm nearby. Yes, under the tree. We stay a couple of days, and after that, not safe. We said we want to uh, go to Turkey. So you're staying at the farm in the open, like under yes. under a tree. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And you have how how old are your children at that point? Yeah, three years, four years, and one years. So yeah. I remember you saying, and there's snakes at night. Yeah, snake and bugs, and so I all the night watching my kids when they're sleeping on yeah. the floor. Yeah. So what happens then, Hayat? What do you do then? After that, we have uh, Mahmoud's brother. They were in Turkey working there. So Mahmoud, he said, like, not good life to live there, and I can't wash clothes and cook for kids. So he said, we want to move to Turkey. So we went there, and we left with Mahmoud's brother for a couple months until we find the apartment, and Mahmoud find work. So you're in an apartment in Istanbul? Yeah, in Istanbul, yeah. And how many are living there at that point? So you go and you're with his brother and they're, are they a family? Or? Yeah, Mahmoud's sister with her five children too. She went with us and two of Mahmoud's brother and my two or three cousin and his nephew, yeah. How big of an apartment are you talking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just for like two or three weeks and after that each family found their place and they moved. 
So now you're in Turkey and you're, you're thinking this is a temporary kind of situation. You'll go back to Syria when the war kind of finishes. So you start to kind of settle a little bit into Istanbul. And then what happens? Yeah, we left to Istanbul and work uh, around, we stayed there around three years. Yeah, I'm working. But uh, I work hard from um, uh, 7 o'clock to 7. 7 p.m.? Yeah, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. <laughs> but after I finish the work, not give me uh, all my money, you know. Uh, because you're not a citizen? Because you're not a Turkish citizen, you think? No, because uh, we are refugee too. Oh. Because we visit there. They say you're Syrian. You don't. No, not Turkish. You're not Turkish, so no. we can take advantage of you. Yep. And after that, I heard uh, my cousin phone me and said, here, a uh, group, if you want to go somewhere, come in here, Sian. There was something you told me earlier that was kind of interesting about how, as, as you stayed in Turkey, people were becoming increasingly hostile to Syrians. Yes, they didn't want Syrians in Turkey. And so some of, it was a relative of yours that tried to take a boat, yes? Yeah, no. So what happened with, you went to the, you went, you were telling me this, Hayat, that, that you, one of your relatives took a boat and were encouraging you to take a boat as well. What happened there? Yeah, we want to go to Europe to travel to, by water, so. Yeah, Mahmoud, uh, some of their family, they want to go to the Germany. So he said, if you want to come with us, we will go to Germany. And it's too dangerous to go by water, so I didn't go. So I people said. were taking money from people, sending then, them out onto the ocean. Yeah. And then some people died. Yeah, yeah, so I, that's why I was. You were very reluctant. Yeah. So. Turkey became increasingly hostile to Syrians and to other, uh, to, to immigrations and to new, new people coming into mm -hmm. the country. So you were about to talk about, so now there's this, how do you hear about applying to Canada? Oh, no, we applied. We said, go, oh, we don't want to live in Turkey because I'm working, working no money, nothing. I have kids, I have a house, uh, I want to pay rent, you know. Yeah, when my cousin phoned me and I went to register, I said, where? They say, Canada. No, they say first, not Canada. They say, we don't know yet. Give me the information. After 20 days, yeah, phoned me somebody. He talked Arabic. He said, hello, you Mahmoud. I said, hey, you want to go to Canada? I said, yes. <laughs> okay. What do you know about Canada? He's worked with... Uh, UN. Okay, so this is the UNHC that's calling yes. you and saying... Do An Ankara, yes. Okay. Yeah, I said, okay, yes. He said, okay, you have a meeting a uh, couple of days. I said, okay. He said, bring your kids and your wife, come in. Yeah, about uh, one month we went there and say, okay, everything. You were a bit skeptical, weren't you? You weren't sure if this was the real deal, were you? <laughs> <laughs> and after finish all... Uh, appointment, uh, meeting, three meetings we do it. And uh, they told uh, me, you like Canada? I said, yes, I <laughs> want to go to Canada. Uh, but they uh, phoned my wife, said, your husband is going to Canada. You want to go or no? You had, <laughs> you, you had some interesting um, perceptions about Canada, didn't you, Hayat? Why don't you share a little bit about your ideas about what people were telling you about Canada? Yeah, I was uh, scared a little bit before. I don't want to, like, I think I will go back to my country. I don't want to go far away. So Mahmoud, he said, no, it's a good country, good place to go, it's a good future for our kids. So I wasn't <laughs> sure to come here and he encouraged me, he said it's a good place to go. And uh, before our ticket, the airplane, they phoned me last time. They said, you Hayat, and you want, are you sure you wanna go to Canada? I said, yes, I wanna go, yeah. 
And then they picked you up, so you're, you meet this, this uh, group of people from the Lutheran Church at the airport, and you said there were some really kind women, yeah. in particular, that were helpful with your kids. But what yeah. was going through your mind when you were when when he was sleeping at the back of the van on the trip back to the uh, from the airport? You were thinking to yourself, what? Yeah, I like strange people. I don't know anybody. Like first time to meet them, I was scared a little bit to come to new country, new culture, and yeah. everything. So I was worried a little bit and thinking. And Mahmoud in the back, I say, "Are you sleeping?" Because long, like distance from Toronto to here. Yeah. We came at midnight, we arrived here. So I always make sure, are you sleeping or you are awake? <laughs> Wake up, Mahmoud, you yeah. uh, might be in danger. <laughs> 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 you guys have done a remarkable job of transitioning and resettling into this country. And we, I mean, even coming today and just uh, sharing your story mm -hmm. is quite, you're quite brave. I don't know, if, if I went to the mosque today, I'm not sure I would feel quite as, um, comfortable. So thank you so much for sharing this story with us of what it's really like to be, you know, to go from a place of war to a place of transition to a place of resettling. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for everybody, for Canadian government, Canadian people, they help us, you know, to come to Canada. Yeah. It's not, it's not without a, a lot of um, courage. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so yeah. much yeah. For, for your courage and for coming today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And now we're waiting. We are, you know, uh, something that Mamut and Hayat didn't tell you was that they're awaiting their family from, for coming. Their, their family's in jeopardy in, in Turkey. So they are trying to bring family members over and we also, we don't get that choice, but we also are in a place where we're trying to um, uh, prepare. We're trying to prepare um, as we make application. We hope that in the fall, we'll have a small family that will come maybe from Syria, maybe more likely from Afghanistan or Iran or Eritrea, who, we, we, with the blended, with the BVR program, the Blended Visa Office Referred Program, you don't get a choice, particularly other than if you meet the criteria. But um, that they wait for us, we wait for them. So we kind of hope, um, can, do you wanna come up? Because we're hoping that um, now, as we sort of look at this blended split, this 50-50 program, that one of our preparation things is to get money together and to get some things going that way. And you know who was selected to have that particular role, right? <laughs> Truly, it is definitely an exciting time to be involved in our church family here at St. Andrews. And hopefully at this time in our presentation, you are saying, how can I help a needy family? A family through no fault of their own is living in a war-ravaged environment. You have been introduced to our new friends are refugees from Syria. And I'm sure you marvel like I do at the manner in which they have adapted to a new country, a new language and new customs. A huge commitment on their part and what a beautiful success story. I don't know, it may have been mentioned very briefly, but they have been here for five years and already they have purchased a home after saving the down payment for a home. That's truly incredible, and I congratulate you for that as well. In response to the question in our hearts, how can I help? Here are some possibilities. We're looking for some people who want to change the world by changing the trajectory of a family forever. Many of us live a life of privilege. We can worship in this field, building, feel safe, have food security, health services, access to education, and enjoy reliable roads. All privileges. Many of us are comfortable. We have extra money in our savings accounts because we had a good job, perhaps a pension, and maybe even an inheritance. 
We invested in our homes and businesses at optimum times. If you recognize yourself as someone who has some privilege and can write a check, please consider doing this. You can do this in installments or in a single check. Checks should be written to St. Andrews uh, Presbyterian Church and designated Refugee Committee. You will receive a charitable donation receipt. Pledge forms help us know of your intentions and allow us to make further plans. They are available at the back of the church or on the church office counter. Prior to our request today, and this is really great news, four parties have already stepped up to donate a total of $6,000. A great start, and here's another scenario. If four people gave $2,000, six gave $1,500, 10 gave $700, and 10 contributed $500, a total of 29,000 is realized very quickly. Now we recognize too that some of us can't write a big check, but really wish to help too. Well, if 50 people gave $100, 40 donated 75, 100 gave 10, the remaining $7,000 is realized, bringing our total commitment to $36,000. We can do this. Later in the year, we may be planning some fundraising activities, and we know that we can count on your support. Your prayers are certainly needed to ensure a very successful outcome. We do look forward to your assistance in ensuring a successful sponsorship of a refugee family. Exciting times. Thank you. Yeah, it is exciting. And you know what? Actually, the Refugee Committee is kind of a fun place to hang out because we get, you know, all these wild and crazy ideas that get going. And um, so we um, end up kind of going, well, how could we do this? We could do that. So I'm going to ask um, Kathleen to just uh, go forward here. And um, we sort of say, well, how could I do my little part? I don't have a lot of money. You know, there's this stagflation thing they're talking about. There's this, there's that. Um, and um, we end up, maybe I should just, oh, well, it's not working, okay. So here's some of our crazy ideas. Um, okay, I just want to tell you, everybody, July 7th, this Thursday, is my birthday. So, so you know, just get that, July the 7th, birthday. So I, you know, I welcome any emails, greetings, anything like that, but to my kids, I say to them, listen, just write me a fat check to uh, St. Andrew's Refugee Committee on the, on the subject line. And I'm hoping, you know, they give me a, a little bit of money. And, you know, times three, hey, it's a few hundred do dollars maybe even, you know? And if they do it again at Christmas, hey, I'm up five or six hundred bucks. And if Doug forgoes his specialty cheeses that they always give him for birthday and Christmas, then, hey, we're, we're double, you know? Easy. Or I don't know if anybody else is like into, um, PC points. Anybody here a PC point collector? Oh my gosh, if somebody, if the checkout lady says to you, says to somebody in front of me, um, you know, like, you know, do you collect PC points? And they say, no, I almost feel like going into a marketing spiel, you know, like, what do you mean you don't? Like, I get $25, $30 every month, you know, like, I really do. I, I make good money out of my PC points, right? So what if I just wrote a check for that money, it's like free money, or I bought a gift card instead, and I put it in the offering, point, uh, offering thing and just said, this is, to fill the, this is to fill their fridge when they get here. What if, um, you know, I happen to know that Kathleen, she, ha has anybody ever tasted Kathleen's Christmas, um, Christmas platters? She, See, it, there's, this is the advantage of being on praise team. You get one at Christmas, and, and people at her workplace ask her to, to make them for her. She has this amazing baking gift, as does Hayat. Oh, my gosh. This is worth coming to the refugee committee just for that, because she makes these amazing, what are they called? Can Baklavas and can Kanafa. Oh, the Kanafa is really exquisite. Anyways, so she sells those a little bit on the side, and, and 
you know, Kathleen does a little bit. I bet you every one of us could say that we have a little skill, that somebody would be interested. We should make a big board or something in the church and have a little barter system. Or, you know, this is inspired from Jackie and Ed. Now, Jackie and Ed were at our house for, for dinner in the spring, just before Lent. And um, I say to Jackie, do you want a glass of wine? And Jackie's like, oh, no, no, we're, we're giving up wine. For, for, for Easter, I'm going to pick on you guys. So, so, so or we're giving up wine for Lent. And then she looks slyly at, at Ed, and she goes, it's not Lent yet, is it, Ed? And, and so, so we polish off a bottle of wine. And, and so I'm thinking that, you know, if we went kind of on a Lent thing, gave up wine for six weeks, or, you know, what's a, what's a bottle of wine, 20, 25 bucks, you know? Now we're, now we're into 150 bucks. Maybe for hookstras, it might be a bit more. Um, uh, but anyways, it, you know, think about your haircut during COVID. You know, during COVID, we had this, you know, these interesting looking haircuts. I figure if I learned that I could go longer without a haircut, right? And so I was like, if I went from just getting it cut every four weeks instead of, and went to six weeks, Oh my gosh, I could save myself 150 bucks just like that. So there are all kinds of fun ways of kind of challenging yourself and sort of saying to yourself, um, how can I come up with 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 150 bucks? It's kind of fun, actually. I'm going to just ask you to move that forward. Um, there are lots of things we can do in kind. So it's not, we're, we're thinking that housing is going to be a big challenge for us. And it, we're told that we shouldn't probably rent it ahead of time because um, the, like, we don't know exactly when they're coming, so you can't really say to a landlord, oh, could you just hold that for us without paying rent? You know, So we will need some temporary housing. If you have a cottage, if you have a basement apartment, if you have a space that can be short-term or you have a beat on something that's more long-term, we'd like to hear from you. Also, um, there are things in kind, and I was talking to Mary Wojcicki that t she told me that if you can get something like a car or a computer assessed, you can actually get a tax receipt for it. Didn't know that. So um, if you have something like that, some large item that you realize people are going to need, that would be great. Um, many of us have connections in a community. In our family, we did this family garage sale, right? And it was easy. Doug's family just said, sure, we're happy to, we made $1,000 that day. And it was easy to kind of come together. Many people have connections in a workplace. They have connections in, you know, the Lions Club, the Canets, the whatever. The people have connections in communities where they might be able to assemble a donation, and that would be great. Um, one of the things I want to say, though, is that we want no guilt trip. No guilt trip here. We, none of us know what other people's situations are. And I'm, you know, we're saying, hey, can you give something? Can you be part of this? And it is a tag team. And it may not be that you are tapped on the shoulder. And that is okay. It's fine. We need cheerful, happy givers only. Because things happen in our lives. I don't know whether you've got some commitment on your plate that nobody else knows about. We have this, um, so I worked in mental health for many years, and I found this, this is, you know, a piece of trivia for you. It turns out that giving helps our mental health. It gives us a sense of significance. It boosts our happiness. It gives us a sense of purposefulness. And if we give because we feel guilt or pressure, we lose that benefit. So happy givers only. I'm going to ask others to come up and to, to just uh, remind us with some scriptures um, what uh, scripture says about giving. I'm reading a passage from 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly and not, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I'm reading from Matthew 25, verses 37 to 40. 
Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome thee, or naked and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick or in prison and visit thee? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say unto you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. I am a refugee sponsor because I don't think that just because I was born in Canada, I deserve peace. I think we all deserve it. I am a refugee sponsor because they're great people and we're happy to have them here. I'm a refugee sponsor because I can do something. I am a refugee sponsor because they are fellow human beings. Because my family was an immigrant family and uh, started a new life. So why not help another person do the same thing? Because it just warms my heart to be able to offer the very little that we can that helps them so very much. Because I felt that I should be helping doing something. Because I have more than what I need. Because it's so much fun when we laugh. Because I believe in bringing other people to our country who might not have a safe place to be. I'm a refugee sponsor because the kids would say, we're free, we're free. 